mark page too because I just there we go. Uh, that's Roger's thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are live. We're live. We're live. Live and it and uh we're live and alive here in the uh, in the green room and this is uh, you know uh obviously oh I got wait a minute let me Yay! I started a watch party. <laughs> we got four viewers on on my on my watch party. I better not look at this because it's slightly okay. behind uh, real time. All right, so I uh, watch yeah, it'll mess you up. Uh, okay, what was I going to do? Oh, I'm going to do uh, this in case somebody. I'm putting the number up there right off because I watched your Tom. You know, we've been. You. This is my fifth night or fifth, the anniversary of my first little live in thing I did. It's my fifth week, Friday night, and so uh, I'm having you back because you've been on before. Yes, I have. And we <laughs> talked about all of our history and we had some good stories. And and actually, um, th there was a circus story that came up that I my daughter was asking me. And um, uh, Mackenzie was telling me we were talking about tigers. And I told her the story about the guy getting attacked. Oh, I'm all over that story. This is a good story. <laughs> it is a good story. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, it, it when I finished telling her the story, she goes, Ooh, Dad, what what'd you tell me that story for? Oh, this is a great story. But but it is. And uh, uh so and it's and it's and it's a and it's kind of a creepy story. Well, it's creepy and it's gross, it's creepy, it's scary. Um, now everybody's getting more interested. I'm hopefully now. But, well, and here, then this it's relevant because of the Tiger King or whatever. Tiger that, King, right? That, I, I, okay, so Tiger King, I couldn't watch. I watched 25 right. minutes of it. I go, I can't watch this show. I was this with show is, this guy's despicable. He's treating these animals horribly. I'm a huge animal pro animal. I like I like animals more than people, generally speaking. Put it that way, <laughs> but. Um, should I tell this story? Well, we'll do. Uh, let, let, let me let me I'll, let me set it up, and and you 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 can finish it up. So so um, Tom and I were on the circus, and the performers' entrance. We had to go through the performers' entrance to go up, uh, which was underneath the stage, and the bandstand, uh, uh, the bandstand, and uh, and Tom and I were walking in, and then out. The show was about ready to start. And I'll let you take it from here. Do you want to describe? Let me describe the shoot a little bit. It, they had designed this thing that would was like a like a slinky, so to speak, right? To me, I would say it was like heavy duty uh, chicken wire. H heavy, yeah, and it, it like chicken wire, but it closed up and opened up, sort of like a slinky. So you had you had steel cable that was wound and and crisscrossed in a fabric that looked like a net thick steel cable and it looked like chicken wire and there were holes like about that big some of them that big and it was you know just just this wiring this wire in a, in a steel frame right so it was a steel frame tube was sectioned off and they set the tigers out to the seg the center ring and the center ring had a cage mm -hmm. and um and we would walk by these tigers and the clearance on either side was about four feet from the shoot, right? Right. And I remember when they first started doing it and seeing these wires, I said, can they get their, I asked uh, one of the handlers, there's like two main handlers. And I asked him, I said, can they get their paws out of that, those? And he says, the guy goes, well, probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'll be honest, if, if they hit the hole with all their strength right in the middle, they can expand it and yeah, they, they can get their paws. So he says, just, all you got to do is watch them. He says, if you watch them and they see you're watching them, they're not going to try anything. And I always had my saxophone case. So I kept my saxophone case. Part of me loves these animals. I yeah. love tigers. And, um, you know, I've gotten to be around some some young tiger and lion cubs and mm -hmm. playing with them. So anyway, 
first set, first show of the day. We're in San Diego, uh, right down there. What's that town south of Costa Mesa? Uh, it was Chula Vista. Chula Vista. Thank right. you. We're in Chula Vista. It's 11 in the morning. The first act of the show right now is the Tiger the Tiger Act. They have these big white tigers. And uh, I can, what you need to know about these white tigers is they're slightly inbred. Oh, yeah. And they're huge. These two males were 600 pounds anyway. So I'm walking by, and I make the turn to go up the bleachers to the bandstand. And Chris, the lighting guy, is walking toward me, walking down, with, and it kind of funnels in towards – and. I hear this scuffling and I'm two steps up and I turn around and one of the big whites has his whole arm outside the cage, claws fully extended, has Chris's, grabs Chris's left leg and pulls it through back through the hole into the chute and starts mauling him. Mm -hmm. Then as he's trying to get away, his arm gets caught in there and now he's got a leg and an arm. Right away, everybody, the guys are on top of these tigers. Now, here's the thing. They're hitting these tigers with big poles that are thick, heavy, and they're hitting these tigers as hard as, hard as they can. I mean, as hard as they can. And the tigers are kind of going like, what's that? You know, stop bugging me. I'm, I'm having dinner right now. Anyway, by the, by the time they got, they pulled Chris out, um, and, I, and I turned around, I saw the whole thing from about eight or ten feet. I mean, I had a bird's eye view in shock watching this whole thing. They pull Chris. Now here's where it gets a little gross, folks. So I'm sorry I'm gonna tell you this. His, uh, was it his right quadricep muscle was torn off his, off his bone to where you could see his bone. Mm -hmm. It was a big flap of skin. The whole muscle was flapped over. He was bleeding. Amazingly, this guy on light crew who was, had been a medic in the army jumped down off his light crew, took off his belt, cinched it around the guy's top of his leg, and pulled it, and the blood stopped. He just cut it off. He, he did two tourniquets right away, put it in, started wrapping his shirt around it, doing all this medical stuff. He had the same problem. He, he scratches. I mean, he was mauled badly. Mm -hmm. And we must have had paramedics on the, on the site. We must have had some paramedics sitting there because they got there in like two or three minutes. Right. Remember I remember that. Yeah, I believe that there was always an ambulance sitting out at every show. Yeah. Uh, and do you remember that Tiger Act? Now, normally the Tiger Act's about 12 minutes long. Right. That Tiger Act was 30 minutes long, wasn't it? Yeah. Because once they started it, the Tigers were not behaving. Those big whites? No. And were you there when they attacked the trainer, too? Yes. That's another thing. The same Tigers actually attacked the trainer during a performance well and, and the, crazy, yeah, what, what I would say, the crazy thing is that the tigers are owned by this guy named cuneo and they're not brought up by the trainers he hires these guys so these guys are going in with fully grown tigers that they've never really interacted with from kids that's nuts i mean even Siegfried and Roy, they, I mean, they got mauled. He raised those tigers. Right. You know, I was at Roy got mauled. Now, the interesting thing was two years later, I'm off the circus and you get a phone call from a lawyer in San Diego. Say, I'm, I'm so such and such a lawyer and I'm uh, representing Chris stuff and we're, um, we have a lawsuit against the Cuneo Tigers. And I heard you were a witness to all this. And I said, yeah, I saw the whole thing, and um, the fact that I the fact that I was told that they knew that the tigers could get their paws out. Here's the interesting: after this incident, they started sliding the the plywood boards in the sides. Remember that? Yeah, they would slide the plywood boards on the side of the chute, so now you can't see the tigers. Right. So why didn't they do that in the first place? They well, <laughs> there hadn't been an accident, and and that was the thing is. Isn't that crazy? Once, once those once the tigers started knowing that they kind of had had their way with things, mm -hmm. that, that's why the the act went longer that day because they were all in a tizzy and they were all whipped up and they were ready to just go after something. Oh man, yeah, and they the sm they smelled, you know, they smelled hu blood. human blood, human blood. And, and that was that was so scary. It, it was weird, and what was really weird about it. 
And I remember this because I had been, I walked in just before you and I, I was almost on the bandstand and kind of started looking down. You were closer. You, right probably a few too. you probably saw it. I did. Now we then sat on the bandstand while all of this was happening, waiting to see what was happening. This took like 30, 45 minutes or, or a little longer. Uh, a lot of people left, but then Cliff, Cliff Vargas came up and said, I'm sorry, boys, but the show's got to go on. Come on. We got to do this show. We can't let it stop. And that was got, that had to be one of the weirdest shows ever to try. Totally weird. Talk about the show must go on. Right. <laughs> wow. What, what a way to start our night together. <laughs> so, well, you know, the thing about the circus is, uh, uh, and especially, you know, I know a lot of people who played Ringling and stuff, but mm -hmm. what we did, being on the road in a tent circus, three rings, the t I mean, the tent held 5,000 people. It was not small. No, it was big. I mean, it was an incredible, incredible adventure. Um, and uh, uh, it'd be fun if you had all got the, had your, your circus pictures out. I need, I need to see them. But, oh, yeah. but I mean, it's a, it's a huge, and it's a very bonding thing for all of us who were on the circus. Because, uh, and it was actually quite musically fun too. I mean, it was a good band, and we and some of the show was some good music. Some of the show, there was actually uh, a lot of the show was really good, and like Eric Jorgensen's arrangement of Caravan, mm -hmm. that was great. <laughs> you play Caravan, you know, da, 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 that was fun to play. And, and Jimmy Norton did some good charts. Jimmy Norton had stuff, uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> that that was great. so. Uh, that that was our our tiger story, and it surfaces every now and then, and it's it's gruesome and 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 it's yeah. relevant. I'm really surprised that that Tiger King guy. I'm surprised he didn't just get ripped up at some point. Yeah, well, at least, yeah. I, I, well, I, I don't know. I, I can't watch it. I yeah, I couldn't watch it, it either. I, I mean, the guy's an asshole. <laughs> so, uh, and he tried to murder somebody on top of it. Yeah, I couldn't watch it either. So uh, I was talking just a little bit before we went live. I, I watched some of your Tower of Power thing today, and you got some of the same questions that that you would normally get many times over. Uh, uh, someone new who hasn't seen you before, and and um, uh, I put my phone number up right away in case somebody wants to call in and ask me questions because this is one thing that I know about. Uh, I don't see your phone number. Oh, there it is. Now I see it up there now. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, you know, um, plus I, on my feed here, uh, if anybody has a question on my feed here on my watch party. Okay. Yeah. You can ask me too. I don't, do you see my watch party? I don't. I only, I can only, I can only see if somebody comments on my, my feed. Yeah. Jeannie Waters says, cats will do what their nature tells them to. Poor cats, so not their fault. Absolutely, it's not their fault, Jeannie. Right. Cat, yeah. No, it's, no, it's, what, what are we doing? What are we doing caging wild animals in the first place? It's terrible. I, I, got, a little bit. I got a couple. Uh, Ellen uh, Winograd, she goes, ooh, lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I went to high school with Ellen. Oh, did you? French horn player. No, a lawyer. She's a lawyer. Uh, Todd Dickow says, hello. <laughs> Uh, but so, you guys can ask if you have a question. Uh, yeah, Jeannie Warder says, "Okay, you're listening. You're really listening, Jeannie." <laughs> uh, uh, so somebody got creeped out. Says, Denise, Denise, uh, uh, Denise says, "Boys, your screens are black. Not for everybody." Oh, oh, they're oh, oh wait, oh, it just went black. Sorry. Oh, you did. Oh uh, no, I would not have known that if I was not looking at my phone. But yes, we went black. So let, let me tell you, I've had the weirdest internet stuff today. I've yes. had my internet crash in the middle of stuff and things go in and out of phase. My there we are. We're back. Anyway, so we're back. We're back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Carrie, Carrie Reimers Bennett, she goes, uh, uh, or he, uh, I, I'm not looking, uh, I believe, says, uh, sorry, but that creeps me out the story about the tigers. <laughs> well, yeah, of course it creeps you out. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I apologize. That was not our intention to, to creep you out, but it's a, it's a pretty crazy story. You know, that's all. Um, yeah, it was a really, story. I, I, believe me, I guarantee you at, at, at the time, 
it creeped me out more than it's creeping you out now. <laughs> I guarantee it. It, it. it was the weirdest day. Um, yeah. And he lived. And um, I, I saw him at the trial. And he had some amazing plastic surgery. And they had to take a tendon out of one arm and stuff. And he was uh, definitely on disability. Um, he, he, his, his one hand, the tendons, because of the thing, is he, he couldn't move these three fingers. But you know something? He, was, he could walk. And um, he could walk fine. And he had, you know, he has, he has a lot of physical limitations, a little bit of a chronic pain. But um, all in all, he considered himself extremely lucky. Um, and his friend, the guy on uh, the guy who jumped down and did the first triage in the beginning, that guy saved his life. Mm -hmm. That guy saved his life. That guy knew about, you know, uh, he, you know, he'd, he'd been in, um, he'd been in Nam. He's a, he was a Vietnam, uh, Vietnam medic. Um, yeah, crazy. Yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. So there were there were actually some good guys. Now here's a, a John Hickey says. Uh, do you take your golf clubs on the road and we need to get you to come out to Philly? Um, yeah, I do take my golf clubs on the road. And um, I had a, a set of clubs I was getting ready to put on the equipment truck. So I was going to have my like my B set of golf clubs just on the road. Um, so I, um, anytime I would always look, believe me, I always look at the schedule and see if there's an opportunity to play golf. Okay, so we're yeah. actually getting the phone call. <laughs> like my Andy Williams uh, or Andy yeah. Yes, I do. Hello. Hey, I have a I have a question for Tom. Okay. Shoot. So, um, I've I've watched a lot of the videos with with Tom and Lenny, and I I apologize if he's answered this on a lot of other forums, but. What is the dynamic like with Tom and Lenny? Because obviously Tom is a bad, bad man. Uh -huh. And Lenny is like the original Tower of Power guy. And when those guys come together, how, how, how does that interaction go? And could Tom maybe speak on that a little bit? Absolutely. What's your name? Uh, uh, my name is Matt. Matt. Hey man, um, thanks for calling. Um, Lenny, uh, Lenny's a, one of my earliest first idols. And Lenny, because obviously, oh, he's. Tom, I gotta, I gotta turn. Uh, so I know you, you might be listening, uh, man. I gotta turn you down a little bit because we're feeding back. Yeah, sorry, I turned, uh, I, I turned up the uh, computer for a second. But, oh, so you could hear the, qu so you could hear the question. Yeah, so that I can hear what Tom has to say. Okay. So uh, I'm going to hang up and hear what Tom has to say, and can I call you right back? If you want, yes. Me too. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, Matt, um, Lenny Pickett being a, a big idol of mine in high school, um, you know, I studied his playing, and, uh, you know, let's fast forward to when I first started playing in the band. Uh, the first time we played uh, New York, he came and sat in. And so, and he sat in and played. And Lenny's a very, he's a very, uh, he's a very private person. And when he comes uh, to see the band, he he really wants to. I mean, he really wants to connect with Emilio and Doc and Dave. Dave was his roommate on the road. He's dear friends with them. I can see that he misses them. So he pretty much, you can tell, he wants to sit and talk to them. He doesn't want to talk to me. Um, and so it took a while before uh, some gigs we'd sit in talking where I had short conversations. It took a while to get to know Lenny Pickett. Um, and that was okay. Um, but he always was very polite. I never knew for a long time, I had no idea what he thought about my playing. And that was okay. Um, I tried not to let that bother me. It could bother me a little bit. It's like, uh, but that's the thing all, all of us play, you know, we're all, as players, we have to be objective about our playing and we have to realize that uh i mean i know people i know people who don't I, a few people who don't like michael brecker you, might, mm -hmm. you know i know some people who don't like lenny pickett you know um very few but i've heard it so anyway so the dynamic as i've gotten to know him 
And because of the 50th anniversary concert, uh, Lenny was a special guest and we had to rehearse for, uh, I'd gotten to know him slowly, but now we're rehearsing for like four days in a row, eight hours a day, then another, a fifth day of a, of a dress rehearsal. And I'm standing next to Lenny for eight hours a day. I mean, we're right next to each other. And so we start, he starts chatting up and starts talking about stuff and asking me a couple questions about my life. And in that week, I got to know him really, really well. And um, somebody asked me today, you know, what it was like to do the, the tenor sax duel with Lenny Pickett at the 50th. And um, to me, they're not duels. To me, they're conversations. Because as I said earlier today, uh, uh, music is not sports. We're not sitting there trying to, there's not a score point. There's not a, there's not a scoreboard saying this person scored more points. Uh, I, I'm trying to play as good as I can play. Uh, I'm trying to compliment what he's playing. I'm trying to feed off what he's playing. And um, actually, that was a really cool concert because while I was warming up in the stairwell downstairs at the Fox Theater, Lenny came over and joined me in the stairwell and just started talking to me. And his dressing room was like on the other side of the, the, the other side from me. I mean, he had to come around the other his, his His dressing room was downstairs, stage right. Mine was downstairs, stage left. So he came over and then we played some stuff together and I got to ask him some questions and we sat there and then we started noodling for like 10 minutes, just playing off each other. And uh, so what it was like, it was like the greatest thing in the world. It's like when your peer, when your idols become your peers and your peers and your, your golf clubs and your friend and they become your friends. And um, I think I can, I think I can say Lenny would consider me, Definitely not a close friend, but I, I think he would say, yeah, I'm, I'm a friend of Tom's. And um, let me see, there's some questions. I, I got a feed going here. Let me see anybody. Um, Jerry says, uh, Tom and Lenny Battles at the 50th concerts were amazing. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, uh, and I know Tom, someone that didn't like Michael Brecker, that's a melody beyond set. <laughs> and, and thank you for mentioning that, that music is a conversation uh, because <laughs> Uh, be, when we're playing music and musicians are playing together, everything is, it is all about a conversation in music and not it, because everything that, that Dave does, the band feeds off of everything that, that Mark plays the band feeds off of. And it, and it's just a conversation. If, if Dave plays a paradiddle or, you know, accents something in a certain way or raise, Oh, and then they jump on it. And Mark, Mark is, uh, Mark Van Wageningen and is extremely, creative from the bass chair mm. you know he, he brings a real different uh dynamic um to the band i mean I, I of course we miss rocco dearly but but um i feel that mark has more than aptly filled his shoes and then and then brought this whole different cool dynamic that's so appropriate to the band and just as good as his own in its own way that's what I loved about you know about Mark VW, right? It, and Dave and Dave loves playing with him. So yeah, Dave plays. You know, Dave plays with a more relaxed. You know, it's like if 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 you're playing with someone who's a great player and who's a great friend of yours at the same time. It makes it makes the gig go so easy every time, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and you guys, in in the current lineup of the band, you guys have been together and become closer than than previous. I mean, it's a really tight knit group right now. Yeah, you could tell because I don't know if people know that Jeff, Jeff came out and we needed someone to fill in doing monitors, or Jeff came out, so Jeff's gotten to be on the bus and he knows, and he's been backstage before that a bunch of times. So I mean, you know, you've seen the dynamic. Yeah, of the band, which is uh, really good. It is, and, it, and it, to get ten people to play for that many gigs and still get along all the time does not happen that often. Who's, who's calling now? Is that Matt again? <laughs> no, I I don't know if it's Matt. It's a four one five number, so it's Bay Area. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hey, Chad. How are you? Good. Who's calling? It's Frank Moran from Chicago. 
Hey, Frank. I know Frank Moran. Thanks for calling, Frank. How you doing, How you doing Frank? How are you? I'm good. How are you, Frank? Uh, uh, you? I had a kink out of the other day. I was watching your uh, sound check with the new bass player. And there's no singing in it. You guys are in New Mexico or something. And it reminds me so much of Booker T and the MGs. Uh, it was it was so cool. I, I really enjoyed it. That's a really good YouTube. That's a very good YouTube of, of that sound check. So Frank, you're an ex firefighter, is that remember or a policeman? You're a firefighter, right? Hey, Frank, can you hear Tom? Yeah, yeah, I can hear him. It's hard to catch up with the phone and everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, so switch your good health, Tom, and if you come back into Chicago, maybe we can play some golf. It's nice to see you. Stay let's, let's tee it up again. <laughs> okay, thanks, Frank. Frank. Frank's one of my, golf, Frank's one of my Chicago golf hookups. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I don't know it when we talk, if they can hear us back on the phone yeah. or whether they have to listen to the feed, which is delayed. And then it's hard to hear. Yeah. I'm seeing if there's any question. Um, hey, Raul Fernandez says the whole rhythm section is the best it's been in years. I agree. Yeah, I think so. Raul. Yeah. Hey, Raul, by the way, a, a shout out for Raul. Raul has a really uh, great uh, internet a radio station called Horn Horn Driven Radio. And uh, so you can check that out. You just Google Horn Driven Radio and you can find find Raul's. And he plays some really, really great music, especially so, like horn. horn driven, uh, would that mean I would have to listen to a lot of horn players? Yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> Drummers. Okay. I don't, well, come on. You know, I'm a drummer. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no, um, but you know, it's funny, it's, it's, uh, people were asking me, of course, one of the questions I had today was, you know, my early influences, and, um, you know, I forget now, and, and somebody asked me what I'm listening to now, I'm listening to all the old stuff that I haven't listened to in years, um, the same stuff I listened to uh, in, in high school and early college, all the stuff I would I would do over and listen to over and over and over again. And um, uh, I forgot how much piano trio music I listened to. Mm. I listened to, I, I have when I, I don't know what happened to my vinyl, but I had a lot of piano trio music. And uh, it's funny, I don't play piano yet, but um, if I, I, if I can find a cheap weighted keyboard, I need to get one ASAP and start taking advantage of this time. But anyway, um, Bill Evans, McCoy Tyner, mm. uh, Ahmed Jamal. I really love Ahmed Jamal. So one people, some guys, people don't listen to that much. Oscar Peterson, Art Tatum, um, Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock. I, I just I love piano music. Um, so I, that's and that's rhythm section, right? I mean, that's just a rhythm section. Uh, what about if I'm remembering kind of way back when I was first with you hanging out in the circuit, this is in eighties. We, we were at the beginning of our careers. You know, this was what we were like 20, you know, early twenties and weren't at the, at that time we were listening to, uh, if I'm remembering right, didn't you listen to a little Dexter Gordon? And, uh, yeah. And then woods. I listened to a shitload, excuse my French, shitload of Dexter Gordon. Yeah. Uh, um, in fact, I came across um, a YouTube of, I didn't realize there's all these Dexter Gordon concerts from the early 60s from Belgium and Oslo, Norway, and filmed and recorded with good sound. And um, I'm going to post one of them. When I when we're done here, I'm going to put one up on my page and start sharing them. He plays um, a, he does Lady Bird live. I think it's from Belgium. Yeah, mm -hmm. Belgium, 1963. He does Lady Bird. You know, da 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 Right. Um, not Lazy Bird. Right. That's Lady Bird. Um, and he just 
tears the solo like in half and he swings back then you know he's just he's swinging so hard and, and uh um back when i grew up in the bay area they had a club called the keystone corner in san francisco it was in the north beach and you could buy a keystone card which was a punch card and it cost about 100 110 bucks for a punch card and I used to work my my uh, my little money gig starting in uh, it was a junior high school. I worked at the Stanford Golf Course, at the driving range, the golf course, and it was a minimum wage job. And I, you know, basically just saved all my money, you know. And every time I got to a hundred bucks, you know, I, I'd go buy a Keystone card, and um, you just show up. And and so Dexter Gordon would come and play the Keystone Corner pretty much three times a year. And like four or five nights in a row, and I, they, you know, I'd see Dexter three nights in a row. I'd go every night, and um, yeah, I was I was just nuts. I think I've seen Dexter Gordon at least thirty times live. I've seen him probably. I've seen him live more than anybody. The other one I saw all the time was Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers mm. and Horace Silver. I saw. I remember when Art Blakey came in with uh, an eighteen-year-old Wynton Marsalis. And then like a 20 year old Brantford Marsalis. Wow. Yeah, when Winton was 18. And because they didn't stay with Art Blakey that long. And, you know, Art Blakey, from what I've read, he didn't want people to stay there. He wanted them to go and pursue. I mean, the Brecker brothers played with, uh, you know, the Brecker brothers played with uh, Horace Silver. And there's a Horace Silver album um, that has a, like a 20, 21 year old Michael Brecker on it. Um, uh, it's the it's the Horace Silver album with, that has the tune Gregory is here. Beautiful. I'm not that familiar with Horace Silver. Yeah, so I used to hear Horace all the time, and um, man, I, I, I miss those days of, of going to Keystone Corner and the Great American Music Hall. And there were there were some great great music happening. When you moved out here. That was still uh, the Keystone wasn't happening, but Great American Music Hall was still having some good jazz acts. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so believe it or not, somebody actually asked me a question about drummers since I like drummers. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I actually, uh, they said, who are some of my uh, favorite influences? The Ansley Dunbar and Steve Gadd, Simon Phillips were some of theirs. Um, so uh, Steve Gadd obviously was a big influence for me, but I might be able to get some of these fellas on. I, I have a plan of having a week of drummers. I still want to try to, uh, uh, yeah, I want to strong arm, uh, David and, and get Dave in here, but Simon Phillips, I might be able to get in here. Uh, <laughs> do you so, know, do you know, Dave, hey, hey, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yeah. You know, Dave Tucker, right? The drummer. Yes. Yes. So my friend, Deborah Gilson, hey, Deborah, if you're still watching, she says you're the spinning image of David Tucker. And I'm going, no, you're not. No, he's not. Who is me? You or you? Yeah, that's what she said. No, I don't look like my feed. I was going. I'm just laughing. No, uh, but uh, Steve DeGaio and Steve. I hope I said your name right, DeGaio. I'm. I'm guessing. I'm. I'm pronouncing that's it right. right. He wants to know if uh, if you've still been in touch with Mark Russo. Yes, I talked to him about two weeks ago, and he's bummed and home. And I mean, he lives 15 minutes from me. He's just up the road. And I should call him again. I, I mean, yeah, he's the same as us. Um, Doobie Brothers aren't going to be playing anytime. I mean, the bigger the the bigger the audience you play for, the longer you're probably going to have to wait to play. Right. So all the big acts that play amphitheaters, 20,000 people, are probably going to be the last <laughs> thing you see. For Tower, we play uh, mostly theaters between uh, small ones, 500 seats, up to 1,200, 1,400 seats. And that's going to take a while. I, right. could see doing a, uh, I could see doing a venue that had 1,400 seats and just putting people every, you know, having every two seats. I don't know. They'd have to arrange the seats so everybody was socially distanced um and wearing masks probably but who knows i mean i don't know what's going to happen i mean are you guys here's a question 
and you guys can all answer me on my feed and Jeff's feed. When we can come to concerts, are you guys going to come back out to concerts? Mm. Are you going to buy a ticket and come see us play live? I mean, I, I, I think a lot of us, I think a lot of us who haven't gotten sick, once we get tested, you know, I, I, I think I've been exposed to this virus. I'm crossing my fingers that I'm one of those peoples that has a natural immunity to it. I'm older, but I've been all over the world picking up antibodies and germs from dozens and dozens of countries, from lots of big crowds all over the world, including Asia. So we calm. Anyway, so I'm hoping I'm, but I, you know, can't get tested yet. Okay, we have another phone call. It's Matt again. Oh, it's Matt. What's up, Matt? I, I have another TOP related question. Okay. So um, taking Tom, Lenny Pickett, and Skip Mesquite out of the equation in the library of all the tenor soloists in the meantime. Go on. And, and I'm talking like Scarpola, uh, Eugene, uh, Norbert Stachel. Does Tom have any of the solos on the recordings of all of those guys? Does he have a favorite? Oh, yeah. Or, or something that he is like, oh, yeah, man, that's like, I really love this as part of Tower of Power history. Oh, Norbert Stachel. That is, that is my question in the. Nor 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 Norbert. Norbert Stachel. All over it, Norbert Stachel. Then maybe David Mann too, um, and I like the other guys too. I mean, everybody was good. Okay. okay. So Matt, personal preference was again Norbert Stachel, and uh, Dave, and, and maybe David Mann after that. And the and, and I still like the other guys too. I don't mean to say I don't like their playing, but uh, Norbert. Uh, I mean, I've always been a Norbert Stachel fan. I mean, um, before he was in Tower. Okay, this is from Palmdale, California. Hello? Hello? Yes. Hi, my name is Rodney Milliken, and um, I'm a true Tower fan from back in the early 70s. Garibaldi's the man, so is Tom. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello? You're listening. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you might want to, if you can, turn your turn your sound off of your. Uh, no, I'm sorry. For a minute. Put or put earphones on. Oh. Is, it, is it okay now? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm Rodney Milliken, and um, I've been a Tower fan for since the early '70s, and uh, I wanted to ask Tom kind of a funky question. Okay. What was the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you on stage? Ooh. <laughs> uh, okay. I got an answer to that. Um, the, well, the one I'll never forget is we're playing uh, on the ride out. In, we're playing at the Blue Note, Tokyo, and we're on the ride out of uh, um, Willing to Learn. And the and the and the horn section, you know, it goes do 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 But I went the horn the horn section the horn section went do 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 bop, and then all of a sudden I waited two bars and I came in by myself, all by myself, and I just went honk. I I just like came in early and I just went like and I. Everybody had to smile in the band, and I just kind of went. And it's funny, I just kind of, I actually went like this. I raised my hand, like, yeah, people were looking at me, like, just laughing. And the other one was probably the first time that Emilio ever did the uh, the the Tommy Big Love Pollitzer intro of me on stage. <laughs> okay. First time he goes, the first time he ever did that bit, and he didn't tell me he was going to do it. I was going. Oh no, we're not going to do this now, are we? Okay, I guess we are. And all you got to do is, uh, I go, you know, and I said to myself, "Well, this is showbiz. <laughs> it's showbiz." 
uh, you know, I'm okay with, I, I became okay with it, you know, but you know, it's like, I always like my, the fact that people call me big love in the band was kind of always an in the band thing. And then now it's like out of the cage and like other people know that that's kind of, that is my, my nickname in the band. Right. It's still, it still is. So, um, it hasn't worn out yet. I, it's, I think it's starting to get a little tread wear. So we'll see we'll see, it's getting a little tread wear, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh. Thanks, Rodney. All right. Thanks for calling, Rodney. Thanks for calling, man. Thanks so much. Okay. Stay safe. <laughs> Those are good questions. Yeah. So I'm just going to catch up with my feed here. Uh, I got 50 people on my feed. Thanks for watching. Um, hey, Kevin Dannenberg. Yeah, Norbert. Hey, oh, what did I? Oh. Uh, Hey Kevin, did you see that I I, I I pimped your mouthpiece today on the Q and A? Uh, How did the Q and A go? It may not be make sense financially to not be able to play to full venues. Yes, absolutely, it may not make sense. You yeah, know, we discussed that. Yeah, uh, any questions here? You know, uh, I ran into um, uh, Lee Thornburg at the grocery. Reed Watley, Reed Watley, who you know. Yeah. He says they're saying big events will resume the fall of 21. Yeah. Hey, yeah. so uh, if any of you are interested in uh, Skype lessons, <laughs> team lessons, I think I think I will be uh, addressing uh, what was long my career before Tower, which is teaching lessons, golf lessons and, too. Uh, actually, I could. I am qualified to teach golf lessons. Okay, so. <laughs> It's like a number that I think I know. Hello? 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 Hello. Yes. Oh, is this the Tom Pollitzer uh, thing? It is. Who's calling? Uh, my name's Chris Dugan. Chris Dugan? Yeah. <laughs> is this Tom? No, this is Jeff New. But Tom's going to say something to you. Go ahead. Oh, Chris. What's up? What's up, Chris, man? How you doing? Hey, hey Tom. It's, I'm doing great, man. This is this is fun. This is amazing. I can't believe I called the number and I'm actually talking to you. That's awesome. This is what, this is how we're gonna live from now on, Chris. We're gonna live in our little cubicles and call each other. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ten guys. This is how Tower is gonna do concerts. You're all gonna be in like separate, you know. I talked to Emilio about that today. I said we should do like a, a Zoom horn section thing. Because I was on, I asked Emilio, I said, have you touched your horn yet since you've been on? And he goes, no, I haven't. I, I probably need to do that. And I said, yeah, let's do like a Zoom horn clinic. <laughs> well, there's been some really cool Zoom stuff. I don't know if you heard that, you, you, you know, you saw that um, that one where Kenny G is the entire saxophone section of this one thing. Oh, no, really? Yeah, I mean, he's actually really good as a section, you know. Well, you know, listen, I have, I, I, I cannot diss Kenny G. Um, he's done a lot of good stuff, um, and and some stuff that I'm not crazy about. <laughs> hey, you, you know what? I met the guy one time at a funeral, and he was the nicest, most humblest cat I've ever met in my life. I know and Kenny. He's People dig it. Music. My favorite thing about Kenny when I, I've gone to see him live is um, he's pretty damn funny. I did, <laughs> I did sound for Kenny G on a corporate corporate deal, and yeah, I, yeah? I have to say uh, he was really nice, and uh, but he was really picky, and if something wasn't exactly right, he knew it, and it, you know. Yeah. Uh, he had his sound, and his sound was supposed yep. to be a certain way, and yep. we made sure it happened. And we all know the stuff he did with Jeff Lorber Fusion before he was when he was Kenny Gorlick, before he yeah. was Kenny G. I mean, that was that band along with Fire Gyro. I mean, they were sort of you know yeah. jazz when it first came out. I I loved it because it had electric bass and and everything and, and those two bands were really cool you know Fire Gyra and didn't we all play Tune eighty eight Tune eighty eight <laughs> yeah. Jeff Lorber Tune eighty eight didn't we all play that at gigs back in the eighties or nineties thing they ever did but I I, I really up 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 we da boo da 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 Yep, tune eighty-eight. A lot of people played that. 
I know. I don't remember that, but I remember Spyro Gyro. Didn't they have that one tune called Something Dance, you know? Dance. Da, 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 or something. Yeah. Yeah. That was a huge hit. Huge, that was the beginning of smooth jazz. And it's a it's a weird it's it's a weird question, and I'm not so sure Tom can answer it because Tom wasn't in the band. But I'm gonna ask it anyway, okay? Okay, I might know it. I might know. You might know it. And if you do and if you don't know it, ask the guys. Okay, the back of the East Bay Grease album. Okay. You have you got the picture in your mind? Yes, the, the yes, I know the picture. Okay, well, I have it framed on my wall. I actually have it framed and autographed by Rick Stevens while he was alive. Nice. I, I, I uh, you know, bought it in a record store and Rick autographed it. Anyway, you know, while he was in the band. But before I digress, think of that picture in your mind. And way off to the right, there's some old cat sitting on a railing. Right? Yeah. Where does anyone know where that guy is, or did they talk to him, or does he even know that he's on that he's in a Tower of Power picture or anything? Uh, I don't know. I'm 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 googling that right now. That's a good question. <laughs> I, I I ask because honest to God, when my band in the seventies, like in seventy five, we went up and you know we played in Concord. And we're from L.A., right? So we, we wanted to go to that place. You know, we, we drove all around Oakland asking people, where's that building that says Thumb Checks Cash? Man, we got to go see that building. And so we find it, and we were like Spinal Tap at Elvis's grave, you know? And, and, and we were so there. But, it, uh, but now, of course, it's gone. I mean, the building is there, but it doesn't say Thumb Checks anymore. So we're talking about that guy. Right there. Yeah, is he just like? Did, did he just accidentally photo bomb the picture and was never heard from again? Or that's probably what happened. Right? Um, yeah, I have to ask the I have to ask the elders, as I refer to them. <laughs> the elders, yeah. The elders, ask him that question, and if they have any information, private message me on Facebook. Okay, I, I will do that. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks Great for, talking. Good to, hear, good to hear from you, Chris. It's been a long time. Thanks for calling, Chris. Okay, okay bye bye. Bye. You will. You see, Chris, uh, Chris, the bass player. Chris, yeah, the bass player. I've, I've done a, a few gigs with them in the nineties. Yeah. Of course, since I. Uh, uh, so I'm. I'm. Oh, John J. Carlson tells me that's Randy Waldman's great video with Kenny G playing all the sax parts. Okay, I'm going to check that out, John. So you know, um, I think they're doing that on that uh, acapella app where you can record all the different parts. Oh, what, you, what app is that? There, there's an app. It, there's some sort of aca. It's called acapella or something. All the singers use it where you can you film all your parts and put it together in a box. Uh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I have at this point now. There's so much. Okay, so this is interesting, and 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 I think you're going through this. Um, oh, we all are. Mm -hmm. With all this time, I mean, I think we all want to be. We all wish for like, oh, if only I had the time to do this. If only I had the time to do that. And now, me personally. I got all the time in the world to learn all these things. It's, it's in a way it's actually overwhelming me mm. stuff. I need to practice on my horn, uh, learning how to do stuff uh, and then stuff around the house I need to do. Um, so I'm learning in my life for 18 years was going on the road, being told what to do. Here's your schedule for the day. Get your rest. Get to the gig early, warm up practice, make sure I always have good reads. My practice on the road would be half hour to an hour, a couple times a week or more sometimes at the venue. I like to warm up because then I can always find a place to warm up where I can. I don't like playing in hotel rooms. I don't like bothering other people and I don't like people listening to me when I'm practicing just that way. So I do it at the venue. And, um, you know, just 
you know, you're on a bus tour, when you're on a three week bus tour, you're just trying to get your sleep. And, you know, it, life is kind of easy that way, because it's all laid out for you. And then you get home and, and you have between a week to 12. Okay, generally, when we get off the ra- road, so sort of the average time off I'd have would be five days to 12 days off before getting on a plane again. Uh, and last year and the year before, were the busiest years and most productive years that Towers ever had. And thank you all for that, for coming out to concerts and, you know, supporting the band. And uh, and we're all very appreciative of that. So when I get off the road, um, I need to just blow off steam. I need to like chill. Um, I don't feel like picking up my horn and playing very much. Um, I don't mind doing an outside gig. I was doing Tommy Iago gigs. And as I think most of you know, who, who are aware of me, know I love to play golf. So I want to go out and be outside and play golf, um, which was a career I thought about when I was 18. I thought about making a career out of golf, whether that meant competitive, competitively trying to get on the pro tour or just being a golf pro and a teacher. Um, because... To me, hanging out on a golf course uh, or a really cool venue, I mean, nothing beats those two things, you know? Beautiful theater hanging out backstage, going to play a concert or nice golf course. I mean, to me, it's like those things are so great. Um, But now I have all this time, and so now I have to be – and like probably most of us, we've dealt with some form of being depressed about this or in a depression. I'm, I'm over it now. And now I'm trying to learn some self-discipline I haven't had to learn in a while. Mm-hmm. Self-discipline. I'm great. If you give me a schedule and say you be professional and be on time and be here, I'm great at that. I'm so good at that. Being on time for the plane, sound checks, all that stuff. Being prepared with what this is the music you need to do. I'm great at that, but now I don't have that. <laughs> now I have to do that for me. So it's a learning curve right now. Um, I need. I, I struggle with uh, sleeping a little bit. I struggle with you know being disciplined to get to bed on time at a regular time. I do find that if I go to bed early and wake up early, I'm more productive. But the other side of it is I'm a night owl. Hey, Tom, do you feel like taking a call? Yeah, we can keep talking. I don't even know what time it is. Oh, we got plenty. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we okay, uh, go ahead. You're on with uh, Tom and Jeff. Hey, it's Matt again. Oh, it's Matt. <laughs> kind of a follow-up to my Lenny Pickett question. Yeah, um, I know Tower of Power travels a lot with David Sanborn. So, Tom, what is your dynamic like with David Sanborn? Okay, we'll wait for this one. I got a good one. So, back about um, I'm going to hang up now. Okay, okay Matt. Yeah, I, I'm going to uh, thank you for asking that. Um, I'm friends with David Sanborn now. I, I can't believe I can say that, David Sanborn. Um, I mean, I, I could actually call him now, and, and, and i got at least a 50-50 chance he'll answer the phone. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so um, back about seven and eight years ago, we spent uh, parts of two years touring with David Sanborn Band in Europe and the United States. And he, he would play first, which makes sense because we're a bigger band. <laughs> And through touring with his band, um, I got to know him pretty damn well. Um, Because, you know, we'd both be backstage early. I'd get there. Um, We sound checked first. And most of the time I would hang out and watch their sound check and then start talking to him and getting to know David. And um, uh, he's an interesting, brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, and I think the biggest thing that, that made David and I close was 
Um, I went and heard him about four or five years ago at Yoshi's after we stopped touring with him. And I was watching him at Yoshi's in Oakland and I was watching with a side stage and he, he always sounds great. But I've heard him play so many times and transcribed his solos and tried to cop his phrasing that, and I watched him and I go like, he's not having fun tonight. You know, he's not having fun. And, and I went backstage and uh, after the show and, and I said to Dave, I said, are you okay? I said, because I'm watching you and, and you're not having any fun. Oh, no, man, I'm not. I just can't get any reads to play. And, you know, this, my mouthpiece is starting to, you know, he has an ornament. Okay, for some, he plays an old Dukoff mouthpiece. Saxophone players know what I'm talking about. It's really soft metal. And it doesn't hold its shape. It, the rails, you know, it was just out of balance. It, it was, the, the, the mouthpiece was starting to fall apart a little bit. And I know this guy, and um, I think any sax players out there might know about the tool called the Reed Geek. And there's this guy named Mauro De Gioia, who's a dear friend of mine. And uh, I've known Mauro before he started the company Reed Geek. Mauro, to me, is the, is the Reed Whisperer. <laughs> Mauro can take any Reed that you have and fix it and make it play like perfectly. And he's done it more than once. I've given him the, I've, I put on the, the, the crappiest read I have. I put it on the mouthpiece, didn't play. And he make it so I wanted to put it, play it on the gig. So I asked David, I said, I, he goes, I can't, David goes, I can't get any reads to play. And I said, do you trust me? He goes, why? He says, I know a guy who can help you out with reads. So I called Mauro up and David, you know, had two, two more shows the next. Night. I said, Mauro, I'm sitting here with David Sanborn. He can't get a read to play on his, on his Duke off. Is there any chance you can come down? Now, now Mauro lives up in Carson City. So that's about a five hour drive down to Oakland. Is there any chance you can come down tomorrow early and work with David? Mauro just goes like, I'm there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I'm there. Tell him I'll meet him uh, at his hotel room. And so <clears throat> that started a, basically a long lasting friendship that Mauro and, and David have now. Actually, Mar um, Mauro knows David much better than I do. <laughs> um, but he, he's really helped David out a lot and helped a lot of people out. I mean, uh, at, at this point, saxophone players, clarinet players, oboe players, Anybody who plays a reed instrument knows about reed geek and the tools he makes and the tutorials and and uh, about um, and I've always said to my students like the most important piece of equipment you have is your reed. The least expensive thing you play the mo is the reed because if you have a reed that's dialed in, you can still get a you can still make a a, a crappy mouthpiece piece perform. Um, and if you have a good mouthpiece with a great read, you can make a crappy sax play great. You know, you can make it sound, you can still get your sound out of it. Um, and the most important, the most expensive piece of equipment is your horn. Um, and to me, that's the last piece of the puzzle. It's really important, of course, but it's the last piece. To me, it's the read and the mouthpiece, and then you find your horn, and of course, if you're a professional player, you're going to have all three going. But as you're learning, though, if you're like learning to play and you don't have a lot of money, those two pieces of equipment are more important. Um, there is a, I played on a number one hit recording back in 1993 when smooth jazz radio was taking off. There was a cat named Jim Chappelle, who I used to play with, that I recorded six. Uh, actually, I'm probably on more like eight of his. On, but there's like six main albums that I'm on. And he had an album when I joined his group. He, he was recording an album called Saturday's Rhapsody. Jim Chappelle 
uh, C H A P P E L L. I guess that's chapel too. <laughs> and it's called Saturday's Rhapsody. Um, it's on Spotify. And there's a tune at the end that's a bossa nova called A Star Contigo, which is a long, beautiful melody played on alto sax that I played. And uh, at that tune went to number one on the uh, billboard charts and stayed there for 12 weeks. It was the first time I ever got into my car and heard myself on the radio. I think it was 92, which freaked me out. I mean, I remember I turned on the radio and the tune was starting and I screamed like, ah, I'm on the radio. <laughs> And that's, that's, I mean, back then, especially back then, that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, now it's like the radio, the internet, YouTube. Um, there's so many more formats getting your stuff out there. But back then, I mean, that, you know, beyond an, uh, an FM station, you know, there, that was, that was it. That was it back then. So, um, everybody thought, well, not everybody, but so many people thought that Jim Chappelle was a saxophone player because the tune featured the alto. Now, here's a funny story about that. I had sold my Mark VI for an old Selmer cigar cutter. It was stupid. I mean, I wish I had the cigar cutter, but I should never have sold my six. But I love the tone of the cigar cutter. But it had intonation problems. And I knew it. And it had a funky... When the, the high C above the staff was kind of a stuffy note and everything else played beautifully, but um, I was having problems with it. And I was teaching at a store called West Valley Music, which Jeff's daughter, older daughter, Michaela, used to work at. Mm How -hmm. I know Michaela. And Dennis uh, was selling Yamaha horns. And I was playing some of these, like I, he, and, I, he, and I was playing one of the student model altos and it played great. And I said, can I borrow this horn? Because the intonation on this horn is like perfect. So I was recording that tune and I was having some intonation problems. So I said, screw it, let me get this, oh, let me get this Yamaha out. So I got the Yamaha student model out and everybody went like, well, that solved the problem. So if you, if you go ahead and listen to that tune, that's a Yamaha student model alto saxophone that I did not own, that I played on that session, that that tune went to number one. But I had a great mouthpiece and a great read, and I still got my sound. We had a great engineer. And yeah, it would have been a little bit fatter if I'd had my six, but it still sounds, I'm totally happy with the way it sounds. It still sounds beautiful. What a great, that's a great story. So the tune's called A Star Contigo and uh, Jim Chappelle, Spotify. And uh, yeah, and that from just from that one tune going number one, we probably that year, I think I got a good 10 weeks of touring with him. Nice. Hey, uh, Dennis Moody says hi. And Dennis! <laughs> he says, he says, uh, talk more about Circus Vargas days. And, and before you say anything, uh, Lori Cook says, Tom, you're a wonderful human being <laughs> uh, and down to earth, kind and true to who you are, just like when you were in Spangalang. <laughs> and uh, Lane Bender says, yo, yo, Dean. <laughs> uh, do you know Lane Bender? Uh, I, uh, Lane, yeah, he asked. I do. I have to go look at his Facebook page, put a name to a face. Um, yeah. So we've we've been at an hour, and uh, you know, yeah. you, are are people still uh, tuning in to you? Do you? What, I, I got I got forty eight right now. Um, current, current. And then again, uh oh, so he's calling. I think it's Matt. Matt, <laughs> hello. Hey, it's Matt again. <laughs> I I I have a question about horns since he was talking about the difference. Hey, Matt's, Matt's questions are good. Don't laugh. Let him talk. How many tenors do you own? And do you decide, um, do you have like a valued March 6th that only is on certain gigs? Or um, how many tenors? That, that is my question. Okay. I have, I have, I own two tenor saxophones 
Um, I have two Yamaha Custom Zs. I have the original black one. I started playing in uh, 2003 or four, And then I have the, the newer version of that that I've been playing for about five, six years. Um, I've never owned a Mark VI tenor. I had a balanced action tenor um, that was just very good horn, wasn't roadworthy. It went out of adjustment really easily. And there was a time where I actually kind of needed to sell it. And I was liking the, the, the Yamaha. So I don't own a Selmer anymore. I only own, own Yamaha horns. I have a Yamaha. I have a Yamaha Alto. I have two Yamaha tenors. Um, my Alto is also a custom Z. My Soprano sax is a Yanagasawa curved. And um, I don't like straight Sopranos. Well, I don't hate them either, but I really like curved Sopranos. And I've been trying to bug the, the powers that be at Yamaha to make a curved Soprano uh, because I like the timbre of the instrument. Uh, better. So I have a Yanagasawa curved soprano uh, and my clarinets. I have two clarinets and they're both buffets. I do not have a Yamaha. I have a, a buffet R13 and an Avet, Avet E11 from 1970. When did I get that one? 74, which is basically an R13. But uh, those, those are all the horns I have. And uh, right now I'm uh, playing them all except my clarinets. Hey, well, my you clarinets know, I was going to ask you about that. How often you you take out a clarinet? You don't ever take any of those on the road with you, do you? I take the flute on the road because you're playing. That's right. Spark, for sparkling in the sand. Sparkling in the sand. And the last time I heard you play that when I that the last night in at the Brooklyn Bowl, I think you did that. Yeah. And you did a, an amazing solo. So I just just saying, I, I always loved hearing you. I I. Um, I went from um, slightly pissing in my pants <laughs> when he said we're going to start playing Sparkling in the Sand because I literally, no, I literally, I'll be honest, I had not touched my flute in 10 years. I hadn't touched it. But um, I had a great flute teacher named Vic Norosco, who is a, a woodwind god. <laughs> he is one of the greatest woodwind players and greatest teachers who's ever lived is Vic Morosco uh, as a player and a mentor. And um, I could, we could go on for, I could go on for a half hour talking about Vic Morosco. And uh, if you don't know who he is, Google him. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he's the one that taught me to play uh, flute correctly and uh, how to approach the embouchure and to get a sound. And, um, so when I started picking up the flute again and doing his exercises, my sound came back, you know, and I was practicing it all the time because I was scared, uh, I was scared shitless. I was going to like sit there and crack notes and be out of tune, and not be able to play any kind of a decent solo. And it worked out. It, I, it came back. And I know the clarinet's going to come back. I have no doubt. Uh, and um, But the clarinet's going to kick my ass because the clarinet, there's so much back pressure on the clarinet that these corners of your mouth have to be really tight. And what's going to happen is I'm going to play the clarinet for five minutes and this is going to happen. I'm going to go, <laughs> my corners are going to blow out. But that's okay. I'm just going to have to deal with that. Um, clarinet takes a lot of strength, embouchure strength. Um, I play tenor today, and, and even when I don't play tenor for a couple of weeks, it uh, comes back really fast. So uh, it's um, just blowing wise. But uh, <clears throat> all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, uh, Katya says, Hey, Katya. And um, Lane Bender. Uh, so he's talking about Dean White um, in the Twin Cities. And I'm, I'm guessing he's talking about uh, Minneapolis. Is that the Twin Cities he's talking about? Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. And do you know Gordon Johnson? Uh, Lane Bender as Jimmy Johnson's brother. Gordon oh. Johnson's a great bass player up there in the Twin Cities. Um, Jimmy Johnson, the bit you mean like Flim and Flim Johnson, Jimmy Johnson? 
Slim Jimmy has a, a brother named Gordon that lives in the in the what's, what's in the water in Minneapolis, you guys? What is going on in that city? That is the most amazing musical city. Right? Okay, so let's see who that again. Hello? <laughs> hello. Uh hello. Yes. Who is this? Hello? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, is this uh, Tom Pulitzer live? It is. Yes. Oh, yay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that uh, thank you both so much for doing this. I very much appreciate it. Well, thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, my question is actually for Tom. Is that okay? <laughs> well, absolutely. That's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, my question is... What is the toughest part about going on the road and what do you do to overcome it? Uh, the toughest part about going on the road is the changing time, uh, time zones. It's the time zones and it's the actual having to, to get to the airport. And I, I don't mind flying once I'm on the plane, but the whole airport process, uh, you know, I'm always, I mean, I get to airports really early now. Um, it's, I'd rather be, I'd rather have to kill an hour than have to have any stress getting through security or all that stuff. So that's the hardest part. And then the time zones and, um, getting, when you get to your new destination, trying to get a good night's sleep, even if you get there. So you go to Europe and you know, it's, it's an eight or nine hour time difference or Japan and you get there in the morning or whatever, and it's, you just, you're trying to rip your sleep schedule around on a moment's notice and you have to play the next night and you have to do three gigs in a row. <laughs> That's the hardest part. Do you have any other questions? Um, not that I can really think of for now, but I'll call back if I have any okay. more. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Thank you. So that is the hardest part, you yeah. know, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, uh, Kimberly wants to know what the last gig you did was before the lockdown. Uh, Kimberly gold. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey Kimberly. Uh, yeah. that was Napa, the uptown <laughs> theater in Napa. It was her last gig. She says March 13th. Was that the last one? March 13th. Sounds about right. Yep. Yep. Yes. I'm, I'm that, I'm, without looking, that sounds right. I, so what is it, May 1st now, huh? Yeah. Wow, wow. Six weeks, six weeks of no gigs. So my last gig, I did the 14th. My last gig was on the 14th, and I was supposed to have one on the 15th. And then I had almost every day that next week booked, was going to pay my, my next month's rent, like dominoes. It's that afternoon, the 14th. Oh, God. It. it was unbelievable. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, uh, Dennis Moody says he uses Ambient when he's on the road. Oh, and Katja says and, uh, Ambient. Yeah. Ambient. Yeah. And uh, and Katja says uh, sleeping pills work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I I've never gotten a, a a prescription for those two, but I get sometimes I I'll bum one. Our old tour manager give me. Uh, Ambience and I do half an ambient and they do help. Um, but what I actually helps more than the ambient for me is a, a half of a Xanax. I, oh, really? Yeah. Well, for me, because it's just uh, Xanax is more of a what is that? An anti-anxiety drug. It like quiets your brain from thinking thoughts. Because the biggest thing for me is like I wake up and need to go back to sleep, and my brain will start thinking. Oh, we got another phone call. Matt calling with another question. He's got good questions. Hello. <laughs> hey, it's Matt again. So here is my current Tom question. You got good questions, Matt. Tom does a five cover song album of classic songs with no Tower of Power guys in the section. What are the songs and who is the band? Uh, wait a second. Um, what's, um, what's the name of the album? I may not remember. Well, I, Can you I, hang up? Yeah. I, 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 something I did with, uh, 
boy, that sounds obscure that something I'm, has faded from my memory. Okay, Matt, if you could type it into Jeff. Yeah, the tech- um, tell me tell me the names of the tunes at least or the name of the CD. Um because you know, I've done so much stuff. Um what what probably anybody's out there listening. There's still you, people listening. There's still people I, listening. You know I, that you remember that Christmas C D we did? Uh all the, the little horn arrangements I did for my band, my black market band, you oh, and Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I no, I completely forgot about that. That was killing. I completely forgot about that. Matt's gonna okay. Okay. Matt, jog my memory, Matt. Oh, sorry. No, let, let, let me clarify. So this is kind of like fantasy football for musicians. Tom yeah. takes the songs that he wants to do and picks the band behind him with like classic, like you can have James Jamerson on bass. Or it's like, a hypothetical question. What are you going to do and... Who is your dream rhythm section? Okay. I get oh, it. hypothetical question. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. Um, use any Tower of Power guys. Well, I would use uh, Dave Garibaldi on some tunes, but I also would use Herman Matthews on some tunes. Herman. Um, I love Herman's backbeat. Um, uh, I probably use Mark VW on bass. And Jerry and Roger, I would, I would actually, I've been dreaming about kind of doing, uh, 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 I, I, as, as most of you know, I don't have my own CD out and probably something that I should at least do one. And, yeah. um, um, but there's also people I want to work with too. It's like, uh, you know, Dennis Chambers said he would play in a couple of my tunes for, and give me a really good rate. He quoted me a really, a really good rate. And, uh, he says, you just fly me out and pay for my hotel and, and it's this much. And I go like, really? That's that's pretty reasonable <laughs> for Dennis Chambers. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> um, so I may have to, you know, I may have to hire Dennis because just yeah. to play, to like record a couple of tunes with Dennis. Uh, who, 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 I don't know if you guys know Dennis sub for uh, Dave Garibaldi for a two week, for about two weeks on in the band's history. Mm-hmm. And um and he's also um, uh, dear friends with my dear friend, Tony Lindsay. So I know Dennis through Tony and uh, Dennis is the salt of the earth. Uh, not, not maybe one of the baddest, uh, baddest ass drummers who's ever lived, but just an incredibly cool person. Yeah. Um, very, you know, very humble, very smart. Um, um, very encouraging, you know, playing with him on the band since he's all about the music, you know, he, he doesn't have any attitude. <laughs> he has uh, no toot at all. <laughs> I want to throw out a name of a drummer that I'm actually going to have on, on Monday. And, Ooh. and his name is Jerry Brown. He played bass with Stanley Clark way back in the early days. I know who that guy is. Yes. He's badass. I do know who that guy is with stevie wonder for like 15 years yeah and and that guy i took a lesson with him one time and he was the way he hit his drums it was kind of like a david garibaldi thing where he he wouldn't hold the stick real far away from the drum but when he hit it it would explode how the hell do you do that (laughs) that snap i mean i watch you know it's funny I've actually taken a, a a stick lesson from David Garibaldi, you know, because he sits there and I'm watching, you know, the way he controls the stick and the fulcrum, the way he holds it, and then he controls the bounce with his fingers. And it's about, it's, 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 it's so, when you learn to control the bounce, it's so effortless and you can like make the stick speed up. Like you use the stick's own momentum and you just fire it at the, you know. Plus, he always hits the snare drum in the same place when he wants to for the sound. Right. And he told me he used to practice on a on a practice pad that was that big. Right. Mm-hmm. A little tiny square practice pad. You know, he used to practice on that, um, so that you you know the precision thing. So, 
and so he sat there and he, and he gave me a little lesson on how to, how to hold the sticks and and uh it was pretty cool yeah so all right so um uh the the drums and how you hit them where you hit them and, and it's this is one thing that i know about about drummers and and how they hit herman herman again is like one of those guys when he hits the snare drum you you know it's him playing right uh, and um there are so many drummers that can hit but they they don't really hit right you know and then you got the guys that can sit down and make any drum sound good because of how they hit the drum uh, yeah. you know what it is it's it's so there's guys that hit the drum when I see they when they don't let the stick bounce, when they hit it, and they're not trained, and so the stick sit, sits on the head longer than the guy who lets the stick bounce. And so if the stick if you hit the head and you don't come off it faster, the drum doesn't get to resonate. Right? It doesn't get to sing. Does that make sense? It, it does sometimes if you're playing soft guys want to do that though sometimes they want to choke the sound of this okay. off a little bit but but in a band like tower you got hit you yeah got hit. dave and dave um seems to create a, a a great amount of volume when he wants to without looking like he's in effort that it's effortless it looks effortless it's it's it, it's just he's very efficient um, and he talked about that with me. He's very efficient with this, the way he does it. And it's, I think it's that Chuck Brown stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Let me see if there's any questions here. I got, uh, can't so, keep up with my feed here. <laughs> Tom, we've got, I think we should, we, we've been an hour and 20. We should do another, oh. another 10. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I love, well, I love talking to you, Jeff. And the fact that people are participating and, and, wanting to ask questions and stuff is, uh, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's better than sitting here and trying to find something on Netflix at this time of night. Th this is true. And this is the same kind of conversation we'd be having anyway. We're just sharing it with everybody. So this is true. It, and it is pretty cool that, uh, okay. I think this is the, he hello. Hi, I actually came up with another question. <laughs> Good. And what was your name again? Uh, Melody. Melody. Oh, Melody. Hi, Melody. Melody is from, uh, Melody is a student at da down in Barstow. That's right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my question is, what's the most effective way, in your opinion, to practice jazz articulation? Okay. Uh, you need to practice really slowly, and you have to learn to tongue the upbeats and slur to the downbeats. And when you articulate, you 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 got do da do 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 do. It has to be the most legato tongue that you can possibly do. So what I used to do is I would just play a whole note. So as I'm singing it, my tongue is interrupting the sound of my vocal cords by lightly touching the roof of my mouth. Da, da, da. All this time, my air is can come, always going. The airflow never stops. It's like you're playing a whole note. You're playing a whole note and you interrupt the reed with a light touch like I did on the roof of my mouth, but now you do it on the tip of the reed. And do da da now, and you and you practice really slowly, really slowly. And when you're practicing slowly, it's a triplet feel. Triple that, triple that, triple that. Do da do da do da do da do. And you practice slowly, and record yourself because we all got phones now to make sure that you're not going do da da. There can't be any break in the sound. There can't be, or it doesn't swing. If I do that, it doesn't swing. The faster you go, you, do, you speed up, the less triple it feel 
there is. So when you hear Parker or any bebop player playing at 300 on the metronome, their, their swing feel gets even, pretty even. It's still, it's still more on the downbeat is longer than the upbeat. But when you go slow, yeah, so that's, you gotta practice slow. You gotta be legato. The airstream has to be always going like it's playing a whole note. You know, the air can't stop. You're just interrupting the vibration of the reed with your tongue. So that's how you do it. That's how you practice it. Did okay, cool. <laughs> if I do, if I do, uh, you know, watch, if I start doing Zoom lessons, we can have a, a Zoom lesson or a Skype lesson uh, and we can talk about it more. I'm, I'm thinking about doing that. That would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. so you know how to get a hold of Tom, right? Yeah, my Facebook page. Yeah, that's good. Good, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Cool. Thanks, Melody. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Bye. Yeah, Melody's a student. So, um, we have another phone call? No, that was her hanging up. But uh, so, uh, I Melody, just let me just say, there's a, get props out, there's a, Every year I, for the last 10 years, I've been going to, uh, in May, I go to Barstow and I do clinics and uh, it started with Mick Gillette. And Mick Gillette was going down there as a guest soloist um, with the uh, Barstow Middle School Band directed by and this guy named um, Dan Barrelloni. And Dan is a really, really great director a very good saxophone player himself has a in all places has a great pro had a great program going in Barstow. We bring Mick in, and then Mick started bringing me down. And as we all know, we lost Mick a few years ago. And then Adolfo does it with me. And um, God bless him. Dan has 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 me back every year, like for ten years. And so uh, Melody's a student there at Barstow High, and um, of course. Um, this next week would have been the week we were going down to do the clinics and the concert. Oh man. And of course it's not happening. Um, and it was actually fit into our schedule too. Um, so I would have been able to do it. So, uh, I, I do know Melody, um, from, I think, uh, I forgot to ask you, Melody. Well, you just froze up. Tom. <laughs> okay. Uh, everybody, I know we, you might still see me, but Tom froze up. Um, so hopefully he will log back in and, uh, let me see if I can text him, Tom. Um, hello, Tom. Let me see if we can get 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 him. There, I'm going to keep talking. It looks like he's going to log back in in a minute. Hang on, folks. This is live TV. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not TV. Uh, log back in. Okay. Fingers crossed. There he comes. There. Okay. I did it. I did it. <laughs> you know that that was longer than you did with uh, um, uh, this afternoon with uh, the bass player, um, uh, Bill. Bill. Yeah, yeah. You guys went all that, and he finally froze up. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. The the um, uh, the internet. We just have no control over the internet. It's just going to do what it wants to do. Yep. Uh, today was actually one of the worst days I've had with the internet because apparently everybody in my neighborhood decided to get on the internet, and mm. there's a, a thing you can do called a speed test. So you can log on to your to a page. I know, and, I know that. Yeah. Right. So the download speed isn't what affects what I'm doing. It's the up can I, speed. Can I? Uh, okay. Yeah. So Kathy, uh, uh, Kathy says, where can I leave a tip for Jeff bringing us these great shows? So everybody who's on, uh, 
Jeff is Jeff doesn't want to do this, has a hard time doing this. Look at him. He's looking down. He's not looking at the camera. And, um, you know, and Jeff has no income. Uh, neither do I. But Jeff is a, really a gig worker. And um, so uh, send Jeff some grocery money. Five bucks, ten bucks, uh, you know, you know, put it up there. Stop, stop, stop getting all sappy on me. Okay. okay. <laughs> put it up there. Come on. I'm going to send you some money for, for having me on. I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay to play. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the way gigs are supposed to go, right? If you, you get the, yeah. you got to bring in the guests. Uh, <laughs> uh, but put it up there. I've just got a Venmo. And everybody who's still watching this, please go to Jeff. What is it? Jeff News Music on YouTube. You know, it. my YouTube channel is just Jeff News. Jeff News, just please go and subscribe. It does not cost you anything to go to YouTube. I know y'all go to YouTube. Just go to Jeff News and subscribe. And he's got all these great interviews from, like, you got Bernie Dressel. I mean, uh, today, uh, who is the actress you had on yesterday? Christina DeRosa. Dina DeRosa. Yeah, I've never seen her before. It's like, you know, some heavy, you know, some heavyweight people, dude. Yeah, and and uh, Zuri, <laughs> Zuri Appleby last night. Who is that? Okay, she's a young female bass player that I was going to have. Uh, I was trying to start a band with with and a few years back, mm -hmm. and I got to know her a little bit. But little did I know that she had, was touring with Nick Jonas. Really? She, okay. She's Lizzo's new bass player. She was musical. <laughs> wow director for willow smith and uh she was has been she was supposed to be this week in residence with adam lambert in in at the venetian room in or the venetian in las vegas so she's she's working and she's done CeeLo green i mean she just wow she's i'm gonna watch that one because i've got i go back and you know i i i feel bad because i i usually try to do a watch party for you but you know, I'm outside and doing stuff, but I'm trying to catch up on some of these videos, these interviews you've had. Is they're, they're really good, man. Well, I, I really enjoy them. I appreciate it, Tom. And and you and I have been friends for a long time. We're like brothers. We've like everybody from our first interview. We told everybody how I I was adopted by your parents and become one of the family. Yep. And there, no one has supported me and pushed me in this more than you and David Alt. The two of you have really if it, it if it weren't for you i would not have the legs that it has the way it's developed and mm -hmm. your your support has been is heartfelt you got you know you got your interviewing skills are getting really good and um your personality and you know who's that guy i was telling you about who like blew up on youtube now um breeding uh I mean, he's got millions of followers. It's just like, I don't know. Maybe this is like this new pandemic career that we're going to develop for you. Because <laughs> I tell, I couldn't do what you're doing. What, what? I mean, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I just, I wouldn't know what to say. I would, I, I, I do it twice a, a day. I mean, you really, well, you really got some chops, you know. Well, here, here's, here's what, what what i've no one really wants to take the time to watch an hour uh a lot of times uh, right so it becomes like a podcast but for, hey, put put a hey, put put the put the venmo and the thing up now i, I got did. people saying on my you did I oh did. there it is oh i see it now oh, i see it now I, I can't see it on this screen okay, yeah cool um <laughs> uh, so but what what i am is i am interested in people and i am interested in especially musicians and spiritual people so that's why i have mostly musicians and, and people that i know uh so everybody that i had on so far are people that i know and mm -hmm. i've had a relationship of some sort with and i want to know about their lives i want to know things that when you ask them a question you're going to get 20 minute answer like like uh, Bill's story about Bobby Darren this afternoon, and you know, oh, that was great. Yeah. That was I was just I was mesmerized, and he he got teary eyed, you know, because he and Bobby Darren were. I love Bobby Darren, and to listen to him talk about 
you know, I'm going like, oh, wow, this is the bass player with Bobby Darren and he auditioned for Buddy Rich and and then he and then he got the he got the gig at Greece and I mean it was quite a great story right? that was that was a great story yep. everybody should go and watch that by the way <laughs> he's going to come back next Friday just to talk about his years with Glenn Campbell Campbell yeah now now here's the thing is when I first was started doing sound. Um, I started doing sound. One of my first gigs with the, was this band called the Four Preps. Now, their first hit by the leader of the band, which was still the leader of the band, Bruce Beland, he wrote that song, 26 Miles to Catalina. 26 Miles what? 26 Miles to Catalina. Hmm. It, was, no. it was a number one hit the year I was born in 1958. <laughs> So I'm doing sound for these guys and they're, they're old, but I'm sitting with them and I'm asking them, what was it like being on the Ed Sullivan show 26 times or whatever it was? And this was in the early sixties and, and they all went to like Hollywood high and I'm starting to hear these stories and I'm fascinated. And this is the stuff yeah. about before we go out and go to, go to work. And, and they're the kind of stories you don't ever really get to hear when you're sitting in the audience. And so but you get to hear them in the green room, right? In the green room, right? <laughs> this is about, so, so Bruce says, well, let me tell you, I was like a sophomore in high school and this is what it was like in Hollywood in the, in the mid fifties, mm -hmm. I was going to Hollywood high, I'm walking home and this kid and this guy pulls up next to me and goes, Hey kid, you want to ride? And it was Sammy Davis Jr. What? Really? That's wow. <laughs> so he goes, so I jumped in the car and Sammy Davis Jr. gave me a ride home. Wow. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm going like, damn, that would be cool. <laughs> you know, I grew up. In yeah, I would have loved to have met Sammy Davis. Everybody just said he was amazing. Right. He's so, cool, nice person. Right. So, so those are the kinds of stories. And so when I get people on and I, and I ask people, but what was it like Zuri, you know, Zuri's this great, go ahead. No, I was just going to say Sammy Davis is a hell of a drummer. I, yes. People yeah. don't know that. Right. Go on, yeah. Go on about Zuri. <laughs> what we think about Zuri. So here she is, this great bass player. I'm looking at some stuff and then I find out right out of high school, she went into the Marines. And she was in the Marines for four years playing in the band and you know, the Marines band and, and has this Marine kind of mentality and discipline and yeah. this whole, and all of a sudden I'm looking at her in a different way and thinking about her as this, this person other than just a bass player. Right. So I could use some Marines discipline right now. <laughs> so, so my point is, <laughs> is when we get to talk to people and hear their backstories and, and hear the things like, like uh, Dennis, when Dennis told me, and I don't know if he's still watching when he told me about, you know, his first gig w was with, um, um, get, uh, get the guitar. Get, was it guitar Watson? Uh, Johnny Guitar Watson. Guitar Watson. And he was in the studio over here and goes up and he, he said, Guitar Watson said, what happened to your gig? He goes, I lost it. It didn't come through. And he goes, well, okay, come with me. And like two days later, he's at, at Madison Square Garden, you know, doing his first live gig. I'm, I'm, Dude, what a story. I mean, you know, <laughs> so I, I, I from, from that point of view, I'm a fan of everybody I talk to because I want to hear all this stuff. Me too. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, you know, I, I think being in the music business, and, and, and getting to play, we never stop being fans. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think some, maybe some of them, I mean, I don't know if you're really huge, you know, it's, you know, even Prince, I mean, Prince, like, like, you know, Prince, I mean, he was still a fan of so many people. I mean, Prince was like, Prince would come and hear Tower of Power when we played the Dakota in Minnesota. He came at least twice and watched our show. Mm. He would come, he would let the owner know he's coming. He would enter right at the last minute with his bodyguards and they have a booth up in the balcony for him. And he usually left 
before, but he came twice to the show. I mean, so I watch. It's like, damn, Prince is up there listening to Tower. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> God damn. Right. I mean, I, of course, I I wish he would have come back and and hung out and and just you know talk talk to us a little bit, but that's okay. You know, that wasn't his deal. So, but the fact. <laughs> the fact that he came to the show and wanted to come and see us more than once when we played the Dakota in in, in, in uh, Minneapolis. Mm. And uh, I miss playing. I mean, what a town. What a music town. Holy oh, crap. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, there is – I did a show there uh, when I used to do my nurse's show, which we've talked about. And I, right. would, I would conduct the show and hire a local band. And Gordon John, I hired Gordon Johnson and Kent Strand, who is originally from there. And, uh, and then there's this whole um, God. I'm going to go brain dead on the the name of the the family, but there's a whole musical family. The Petersons. The Petersons, yes. And <laughs> Barry Player is on the Tonight Show, and then and then I mean, there's a how many of the Peterson family is there? And they were with Prince, and I mean, what it what a musical family that that whole town. Yeah, well, there's Ricky Peterson play with David Sanborn. Mm -hmm. And Paul Peterson, his slightly younger brother, who plays bass and guitar and writes, and and uh, um, and both those guys grew up knowing Prince. And then there's um, Jason Delaire Peterson, who's uh, actually uh, the nephew of those two guys, and who plays. Uh, he's been out. Jason plays, sings, and plays keyboards and great sax. And um, he's a badass, and he's and then there's Patty and uh, the two sisters. The mom was unbelievably great piano player, and you can find all these YouTubes of the Peterson family. Uh, that whole family was ridiculous. And then there's the 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 bass player in L.A. Is that Tom Peterson? T Tom Peterson was the the Barry player. He played Barry sax. Tom there's the yeah. Okay. Barry. Yeah. And I mean, it's, they're all great musicians. All of them. It's just, I hate them. No, <laughs> it's just, no, that's a, it's ridiculous. I, I, yeah. I, I, what a talented group of people. So John Mater comes over to, to my house and he brings his wife and we're having a barbecue here last, <laughs> last year. Sorry. I'm, I'm reading, I'm reading some, some say he said, go ahead. So and, John Mater came over. Yeah. And so I saying to Wendy, his wife, I go, you know, the very first time I saw John play, I hated him so much. Yeah. And John, <laughs> why, what did I do? I said, nothing. You were just so damn good. I hated you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That whole thing, you know, um, oh. Oh, uh, Tom Peterson, cheap trick bassist, unrelated. Unrelated, okay. That's a different Tom. Pe the Tom Peterson from the Peterson family is the Barry Sax player from the Tonight Show. Okay. Yeah. So. What? Yeah. Incredible family. Any more questions? But, and, oh, and, and on your feed. Oh, uh, just looking. No, just people making nice comments. Yeah. Really nice. Really nice comments here. Thank you, everybody. Um, I want to give a shout out to. Um, Another great bass player. I haven't, if he's still listening, Chris Stefanetti. Oh, and uh, you, and and uh, I think it's Chris, but Chris is such a great bass player. Really good. And uh, and uh, I'm not sure. I have to go to your Facebook page, Chris, if you're still listening. And uh, I would love to play a gig with Chris. Chris is a bad ass dude. <laughs> yeah. And I I haven't I haven't seen Chris in 20 years, probably at least 25. Yeah. It's been a long time for me. I, I got to tell you, you know, we're at an hour and 45 minutes. We're all yeah, I know. Well, you know, I, I just like talking to you. I don't care if anybody's listening at this point. It, it is fun, but I'm thinking uh, I, I might be able to split this up and make two shows out of it. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I mean, mean, I still I still have a, I still have a 47 people. Thank you for watching. <laughs> okay. Uh, people, oh, no, it's, Question. Matt. Matt's got another question. Okay, Matt. As you guys are staying on, I got questions for Tom. Okay, go ahead, Matt. All right, my 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 question is the opposite of my other question is mm. put together non Tower of Power rhythm section and three to five cover songs that you do with that band 
<laughs> using only classic oh, Motown oh, and Stax oh, rhythm section. So wait a second. Can I ask you a question? Good. Matt, you still Matt. there? Matt? Using so okay, do you think when he said using only old like old stacks rhythm section, he's thinking of like a hypothetical rhythm section of old guys, right? That's what he means. The older rhythm section guys, right, Matt? No, he hung up. Yes, the older rhythm section guys. Who, who would I hire as older rhythm section guys? Our guys, only classic rhythm section guys. And what songs do you do out of that library? And Tom is fronting the band. Harvey Mason, Jamie Jamerson, George Benson on guitar, um, um, Ronnie Foster on, on keyboards, and we're going to do a, a remake of, which a tune is, a, I've always wanted to redo. Oh, God, nobody steal this from me now, okay? But there's that tune, um, that's a, 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 I used to do this tune. Um, he said cover tunes. And I used to do a really good version of this with Spangalang. But that tune, come with me, da, 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 with you I'm born again. Da, 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 da. But we used to do it in 4-4, which really changes the whole vibe of the tune when you do it in 4 do da, da, da. We used to do it in 4-4, four, four, which changes the whole. So I've always wanted to cover that tune. Um, the other tune, wait, he said three tunes. Why are you laughing? Because John Worley goes, remake of Opus Cave Writings. <laughs> All I have to say to John is, ook flee leap. That's what he goes, ook mo fro. <laughs> hey, so let me tell you about, um, uh, you know, John was on the show and he really not, really didn't tell the White Castle story completely accurately. Well. Because I was there. No, I'm not going to do that to him. No, never mind. <laughs> that was one of the funniest nights. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's let, no more inside jokes. Um, anyway, so... That's one tune, Matt. Uh, two more cover tunes that I've already wanted to do. They'll pop into my head. There's a bunch of covers that I would like to do. But really, I'd, I'd like to start doing some writing and write some good tunes. But uh, definitely Harvey Mason, Jamie Jamerson, um, or, or Marcus Miller. <laughs> Marcus Miller. Harvey May I love Harvey Mason. He's talking about old guys. I love Harvey Mason's grooves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is one thing. Bernard Purdy. You know, Dennis, Dennis might actually have some information on this, but but if I'm not mistaken, uh, back in the day when Harvey was doing the George Benson Reason record, wasn't he doing a lot of movie soundtracks? Wasn't he one of the guys that was one of the big, uh, uh, big movie uh, guys, me not, me not know. Yeah, today it's Bernie Dressel, you know, and uh, right. Uh, there's a couple of other guys that I'm, I'm actually going to have on, but uh, I think I heard that Ber that Harvey Mason was doing a bunch of stuff. Hey, can I tell a story? Uh, yes, uh, you just about you just who's tuning in. Pardon? Is it about somebody who's tuning in? No, okay. it's about movie stuff. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. So I'll start off to recommend to anybody who's listening. This is this really great documentary called Score, S-C-O-R-E. Yeah, um, it might be on Netflix by now, but it's worth buying. Score is a documentary about the people who write and make the music for movies and the recording the musicians who do it, the people who write the music, the process that they go through, all the engineers, all these different people that I, I, I got to know through this movie. And I'm watching it, and there's this Brazilian, I think he's Brazilian, named Hierto Piera. Hierto Piera. And he writes movie scores, and he does a lot of kind of 
you know, he does the Angry Birds movies, which is like your kids probably watch those movies. I didn't. But as I'm watching the movie, I'm going like, this is actually some pretty deep movie scoring. The music is, and he writes interesting, you know, because he's like Danny Elfman, you know, he, he kind of hears the music and he has it as an orchestrator and who helps him write up for the orchestra. So fast forward to last year, we play at Royal Albert Hall, great crowd. We got some guys from Phil Collins band, Incognito's there, and Jacob Collier is in the audience and watches our show. Jacob Collier has asked us the next day to come into the studio to record one of his songs and play on one of his songs. And this was at Air Studios in London. Air Studios was the studio that George Martin, the producer of all those great Beatles albums, this is the place that he bought with his earnings from all those Beatles records. It's an old church. It was this old church. He bought it. He turned it into a recording studio called Air, A-Y-R-E, Air Studios in London. Famous place. Big room. They have a big room that's part of the church that has. He still has the stainless. I'm not. I'm going in. I'm tired. It's. it's a, we're going to have to travel. I'm a little oblivious that morning. I walk into our studio B to do our recording, and I'm in there and we're doing it. I come out. They have like a whole restaurant there, cafe staff to get something to eat, and the other doors open up and all these string players come out. All these musicians. Like a whole orchestra starts coming out on a break. I'm going like, what's going on in there? He goes, oh, they're doing a movie soundtrack. I go, really? And I go, can I, can I walk in there and look? And he's like, yeah. So I walk in there and I look at this studio and I go, wait a minute, this place looks familiar. I go, wait a second, air, I'm in air, wait a second, this is from this movie score, it's from the documentary. This is that place. I saw in the movie and I go and, I, and so I walk over and I'm, you know, not touching it. I walk over to the score and I'm, I'm looking and you know, the huge, you know, conductor score. And it says Angry Birds 2 score by Hierto Piera. And I'm going like, and then I look into the booth and there's the guy from the movie when it's all stuff. And I'm going like, okay, I got to go say hi to this guy. I mean, because I love this movie and watching all these guys compose is, it's this very inspiring movie to me. It makes me want to write. It makes me just, it's just inspiring. If you're a musician, you should watch it. And if you're not a musician, you might like it too. I'm going to watch it, you know. Uh, so, but check this out. Just let me finish the story. Yeah. I walk in there and, and, and I go, hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're here to Pierre and I know you from the movie score and that movie made me a fan of you. And I just wanted to say hi. And he goes, Oh, come on in. And he goes, what are you doing here? And I say, well, I don't know. I, I play in this band. I don't know if you ever heard of called tower of power. And he goes, of course we've all heard of tower of power, <laughs> <laughs> which was very cool. Right. Cause I don't want to assume he goes, of course, who, do, who hasn't? And he goes, oh, he's going to come in. And he, and he says, what are you doing? He says, we're recording over there with Jacob Collin. He goes, oh, really? That's amazing, you know. <laughs> and um, he says, well, if you want to come back in, just, you know. Uh, and so I snuck back in there a couple times. And after we were done, um, they had the brass in there. And I snuck back in there. And I was sitting at the back of the room. And, he, and he's recording. And he's, I, I, don't, I, can, I don't see how a guy can say that relax and calm when he's on a budget time clock because mm. those guys are on a tight budget time clock and he sees me over there and he goes oh you want to come you come sit down next to me on the board and so i sat next to him while he produced these sessions for like 25 minutes while he was running with his crew behind me and doing the watching the the the, the movie and he was you know, and, and he had really good instructions for the brass players, the things he wanted, like kind of just really good. It was like, it was amazing to watch. Just like if you see, if you watch the documentary, it's, it was like I was in the documentary. It's like I'm a fly on the wall. This is like so cool. 
and it was one of the highlights of my last year. Totally to just just to be a part of that. That sounds and and the, all those cats like Bernie who do that stuff. There was a time that I dreamed about being one of those musicians. Uh, but I don't know if I, I think I might've cracked under this. I mean, I used to be a great sight reader, but man, you, to get, I, I always wonder how those guys get so calm about sight reading something and not worrying about making a mistake. Right. Like Wayne Bergeron. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, yep. it's like, oh, I can play this, but it's like, but you can't, you can't mess up. You can't, you can't fuck up. You can't, you get fired if you fuck up. You don't get to do that anymore. And, and I, I know what you're saying. And uh, because that was what I was getting at when I had some of the, like, like Wayne and, and those guys and Bernie, when you're in those big sessions, this is what fascinates me. The, the story you're just telling, you're looking at like a whole orchestra, right? And you're recording it. If one person plays, plays something bad, you got it. It's fucked up. You got to start over. Right. Yeah. And you've got a hundred people in there that have to be perfect. They're amazing. Oh. Studio musicians yeah. that do this stuff are in a, in a, in a whole uh, different class. And, and, you know, the only thing that makes me feel good is, is most of them can't do what I do. <laughs> wow. Playing, playing tower, you know, that's a whole different thing. But, um, but we, we, we have mistakes and glitches all the time. <laughs> But just most of you never hear them. <laughs> but we hear them. Right. Yeah. Tom, so. I got to tell you. We got to hang up. Why are we talking for two hours? So Most everybody that's been watching, uh, I'm guessing they were musicians. But th this is. You know, I got a shout out to John Carlson, who's hung this whole time. Jeannie Waters. Reed Watley's still around. Dave Leon. Dennis. Uh, Colette is still around. We uh, over. I mean, people. Uh, two hours. This, these people. Chris Manners is here from Yamaha. Melody's still online. That's Raul still here. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it means it means a lot to me oh. that these. Oh, is that? Hello. Hi, it's Melody again. <laughs> okay, Melody, what's up? <laughs> Um, Tom, you mentioned that you recorded with Jacob Collier. What was yes. it like? It was amazing. It was amazing. The guy is a genius. The guy is a, a bundle of energy. Um, to, to, to realize he did all this stuff and taught himself how to play all these instruments. I mean, he's uh, obviously he's an innate musical genius. Um, his knowledge of harmony advanced harmony is unpar I mean he understands harmony and jazz harmony uh he's an expert like Herbie Hancock knows it I mean he he's got perfect pitch and uh he plays every instrument he's a great piano player really good guitar player bass drums mallets percussion instruments uh, super creative. He did all this stuff. Like his first album was called In My Room. And I mean, he learned how to run Pro Tools, how to do video editing. If you watch the Flintstones thing, which he won a Grammy for, he's got a different getup and a different hairdo for every part that he sings in the Flintstones. I mean, that's really great production values. He's and he did that all in his room. I mean, the kid's a genius. I enjoyed working with him, I, and I asked him, I said, have you ever rehearsed a horn section like this before? Because he would rehearse the horn section on these parts, and and I could tell that he heard, he said all the things that I would want to say, and he was so patient um, because there were some intonation problems. And... And I, know, I could hear him, and he didn't say anything right away. He was actually, like, being really patient. And then he finally said, okay, Sal, you're a little sharp. You need to pull out a little bit and come down. Doc, I need you to come up. And that was the problem. Doc was a little low. Sal was a little high. And, and, and the section was stretched. But he, he didn't do it right away. He had really good 
people skills. That's what I'm going to say. He had really good people skills. And also when he was in his thought process, you'll like this because, you know, he was like 21, 22. He would take off his shoes and he was in his socks and it's a wooden floor, right? And he'd be thinking and all of a sudden he'd run across the floor and then slide on his socks. And then he'd run across the floor the other way and slide on his socks. And he'd do this like, and I'm just going like, okay, that's such a like, that's like, well, he's a kid, you know, but that was like kind of his getting, he was working out his energy. I mean, you know, you can tell the kid, yeah, he has a lot of energy. Uh, yeah, it was, it was incredible and, and very patient, very kind um, for somebody who's such, is it's just so not egotistical in any way. So no, it's no attitude, no attitude. I mean, he could really, that's a guy who could say like, you know, he could, he could have an attitude like, you know, y'all need to learn to keep up with me because y'all just, you know, don't know what you're doing. You know, I mean, he could be, he, I mean, and there are guys, there are musicians that are badasses that have that attitude. And I'm not going to mention their names because I really like the way they play because I don't want to bad mouth anybody. But, um, yeah, he's just, he's just a kind person. I just, I love him. I love him. I just, he's amazing. <laughs> what a guy. Wow. What a chance to work with the guy. I hope I get to do it again. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for calling again, Melody. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, actually, one more thing. Okay. Um, in the, like earlier, Tom kind of froze right before <laughs> that he was going to ask a pretty interesting question. Tom, do you remember what that question was? Before the screens froze? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe. We'll, oh, well. All right. Thanks. Maybe somebody else does. Um, sure, thank all right. You. I got still got 38 people. You have any more questions, Melody? Holy cow. Uh, not that I can think okay. of, actually. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hey, Rob Suddeth has um, joined us sometime. Um, so Steve DeGaio is still here. Kimberly Gold still here. Um, uh, she's got a date with Real Time. At Bill Maher. Real Time with Bill Maher is good tonight. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, 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 it's, it's recording, so I'm okay. Let me, let me say, <laughs> I did not have... Two hours. Did we just set a record? We did. And, and yeah. I, I've, I've been perfectly comfortable and enjoying it. Because, so, again, you and I would do this with without yeah. like the thing going but we've just shared it with everybody hey where's the where's the paypal thing you took oh, it down it. Oh, okay i'll put it put it back up there <laughs> god damn it <laughs> tip this man <laughs> give him five bucks actually actually everybody give him five bucks i think a lot of people <laughs> i think i i saw some emails but it's hard for me to kind of keep track of everything that's going on just keep oh. that thing up there the whole time god damn it <sighs> Jeff has a really hard time with this. Everyone, I do. I, he does. I I do have a have issues. I hey, well, people aren't going to give you money unless they feel like they want to. So you know, don't worry about it. I, I actually, I hey, put it. I'll put one up. You can give the money to me if he doesn't want it. I'll take it. <laughs> actually, I because I, I have no qualms. I was talking <laughs> about there are a few musicians that that don't have any issue with just jumping and putting a live stream up and say, "Hey, give me money." They're yeah. really good about that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I got a little bit of savings, so I, I feel funny about that, but I, it may come to that. I, I, you know, when, when Reed Watley says fall of 2021, before I get to resume what I'm doing, I have to, I have to reinvent myself. Yeah. I can't survive. I mean, well, I'm not going to worry about that now. Let's not get dark. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, here's, but, here's one thing that I'm thinking might be happening for me with this because I've just forced myself to do this. It's and Like I said when we first started, five weeks ago tonight is when I had my meltdown, realizing that I wasn't going to be able to pay my rent and that all my work was, was going away. And I decided to just get on the live stream and do a live stream. I pulled all my equipment in here. Now I've forced myself to do this. I've logged, you know, close to 80 shows now. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's quite a 80. Wow. I don't have them all up on YouTube yet because it 
requires a little bit of work. Um, but now I've through these last few weeks doing this, I've developed some skills that I am having some people reach out to me, having them help want, wanting them, wanting me to help them get their live streams together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe I'm learning something here that will be of value that I can, I can make, you know, monetize it a little bit. Uh, Ivan Johnson says, this is way better than TV. I love you guys. Hey. Ivan. So Ivan, Ivan's a, uh, Ivan's about um, about thirty feet that way. Oh, really? He's my next door neighbor. <laughs> Ivan is the greatest human being in the world. I'm so glad I have a neighbor like him. Uh -oh. I love you, Ivan. I love you, buddy. And yeah, no, he's right there. <laughs> so, uh, Melody uh, sent in ten bucks. Thank you, Melody. <laughs> so, um, and I know a few other people have sent in too, and I'm going to, I will thank all of you individually once we get off. Um, yeah. uh, but, um, you know, I think it, that me doing this with everybody is kind of cool, but if I get somebody like yourself, it almost could be, uh, like a radio show where, where we, we would host like once a week where all these people would call in. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. I would love to participate in something like that. So, you know, and, we, and maybe we do it on Zoom or something where people can. Uh, I don't know. Well, well, yeah. Well, here's like what I've what I've started doing with David Alt, for example. We get in and I I spill my guts and you know get all cry yeah. and everything. This thing, but the the beauty is, is it apparently helps people because I've had. I've responded like, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the funny thing is uh, 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 somebody I knew said, yeah, with, with Jeff, when, when I watched De Jeff with David Alt, it's kind of like, you know, he, he's actually, we're just observing, he's having like a session with David Alt. We're just observing it. I said, yeah, but isn't it true that what he's going through, so many of us are also going through the exact same emotions about being scared shitless that we have no money coming in and we don't know when the government or if the government's going to start paying us this unemployment assistance and make it retroactive. And, you know, in a perfect world, it's like, Jeff, you qualify for $850 a year, $850 a week, and you haven't been paid since March 13th. So we're going to send you a retroactive check representing $850 a week for the last eight weeks. Wouldn't that be good? So, so it's like so bam, five thousand, six thousand dollars, boom. We're sending that to you. Except it's a, a, a debit card, but that's fine. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um Yeah. So I, well, from that perspective, and, and here's the interesting thing is I I I've felt bad about being that open and vulnerable and letting people watch and think and you know, but here's what, what happened. Takes a lot of guts, dude. Well, and and here's what happened to me last week after I hung up and I felt kind of funny because I really was like, geez, David, I, we've been five weeks now we've talked and, and I'm still having issues. I hung up the phone and I swear to God, two guys called me a lighting guy and, um, uh, I think, and a, another guy and they called me and just started telling me what they were going through was the exact same thing that I just said to David and they didn't even know I'm doing my live stream shows. They just started telling me, oh, my God, dude, what am I going to do? I don't know how I'm going to work. And all of a sudden I realized, well, what I'm doing that other people are seeing is maybe maybe there are people that don't know how to say it. And having hearing hearing somebody say it makes them feel. I, I, I don't think I could do it. But you would you, you know, the vulnerabilities that you've been willing to show. Um and, you know, they, I mean, there could have been a thousand people watching. I mean, there might have only been two dozen, but still just, you know, you're out there. You don't, you know, that's, that takes a lot of guts, dude. I, I commend you. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I don't know if I could do that. I, I'm actually, in a lot of ways, I'm a very private person. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I don't know. You, you and I are close, and I, I and I, I know, you, I, I know you pretty well, and I know when you, when you're feeling something, and and yet you are, you are private, but you know you share with me, mm -hmm. yeah, but not, uh, 
there are there are some men especially that when they're going through something you know especially if they've got a family and a couple of little girls or something and and they're sitting there and they're going oh shit what am i going to do and they don't know who they can talk to about what they're feeling mm -hmm. you know um so from from one way i'm pretty blessed to be able to even say anything you know Oh, Tom, we've been at it for, for two hours and 10 minutes, yeah, man. I know. I actually have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. I'm sorry if that's too much information for people. <laughs> oh, you know, okay. But I sh I sh we should probably, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I appreciate being on. I know be with the with the q and A I I had today and, and this, it's like I had some, I really appreciate having some purpose today. Right. You know, just something I had to do, like a gig. You know, you know, in a little way, I felt like I had to do a gig today, and, and that was good. So you really helped me a lot, too. And, and just talking about, just talking with somebody, I mean, um, actually, you know, I remember those first two weeks, I was realizing, like, I got to use my voice. I haven't hardly used my voice in two weeks. <laughs> I haven't talked to anybody. Does my voice still work? I mean, seriously. If you don't use your voice, your voice, it's a muscle. It, it gets tired. And I tried singing some stuff and I was going like, oh man, I got to do some little singing and I got to, I got to get this thing working again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. It's just like, you know, All right. I, I used to be a, a really great whistler too. And I, I and I, I got to start learning, getting my whistle back, but that's clarinet. Clarinet helps you with your whistle. So anyway. Okay. Sidebar. <laughs> so I'm going to throw this out there. I'm going to throw this out there at you because I'm I'm trying to get uh, like a maybe we can do a regular Friday night thing. Sure. Friday night hang with Jeff and Tom. Yeah. And take phone calls. And George Shelby. George Shelby just said, "Hey, great conversation." Hey, George. George. Yeah, what you know, look, between you two guys, I'll tell you what. If I was a badass, here's my horn section. George Shelby. Tom Pollitzer, Harry Kim, Wayne Bergeron, and Eric Jorgensen. Damn, I'll take that horse section for days. <laughs> God, I'd love to. I'd love to be in that horn section. Now that would be a badass horn section. Man. I got to do a big band gig with Wayne Bergeron a long time ago. It was a high end wedding in Napa. Really high paying gig. And the contractor was from LA. It was mostly Bay Area musicians, but he brought in some LA guys. And I don't know, Bernie Dressel might have been playing drums on that. But Wayne was came up to play lead. And that was and I was playing lead alto. And um and that was a fun gig. Oh, and George George, George says we need to have Doc in there too. So yeah, we, we would need Doc. Oh, Doc. Doc. Yeah, Doc would be good. Yeah. Um, also for interviews, I talked with Tony Lindsay and he'd be happy to come on your show. You know, um, you know, can I tell you a funny story about Tony and Fred Ross? Because you know, those two guys, no, maybe I shouldn't tell that story. <laughs> well, let them tell it when they're online. Uh, yeah. There's something to look forward. <laughs> Have you had Fred on yet? Uh, no, uh, but I haven't really had singers that, but that those I've mostly had horn players, drummers, and bass players. Well, Tony, you know, Tony's, you know. I mean, how many guys, how many guys, you know, won 11, 11 Grammys, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> you know, no, but uh, Tony said he'd be happy to. Yeah. If you wanted to get Tony, give Tony a call, I'll give Tony. Yeah. And it would be fun. You know, it'd be kind of fun to get Tony and Fred on at the same time. That would be, well, then you would get pretty, that would get some stupid pretty fast. <laughs> there would be moments of some good stupidity there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tom. Well, let's let's <laughs> let me wrap it up. Let me close everybody out. We've actually had okay. We still we still have thirty five people hanging in there with us, and then and, and yeah, and I have. Let me see on my watch party. I have thirty. Oh, it's the same thirty five. Yes, I don't know. Yeah. Do there. Hey, thanks everybody for listening. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope I hope I hope you was you were entertained in some way or informed or um, just broke up your your pandemic uh, routine. Well, it, it was, it was good for me because uh, we got to hang out and talk, take some calls and, and talk and yeah. 
maybe we can plan on the next Friday night too. And yeah, I hope we get to see you in person before not too long. That would be nice. Yeah, that would. Yeah. All right, Tom. I'm going to close it out with more Roger Smith because I love I love this song. Yeah, it's a nice groove. There we go. Ah, uh, okay. I'm taking. Uh, are, are, we, are you taking it offline? I'm going to end my watch party. Almost. <laughs> We're almost off. <laughs>